Welcome to World of Warcraft, what's next? BlizzCon. Hello once again, it's been so long. All right, I love you all too. This is the best. <sighs> Shadowlands. Like Diablo 4, we can finally say it out loud. And this is the time to tell you a bit more about where we're going and what is next in World of Warcraft. So, last time on World of Warcraft, this happened. The sky shattered, and we are left staring across the veil between life and death into a small piece of the Shadowlands. Well, what does that mean for us exactly? So this panel is going to be a little bit different from some of the past expansion What's Next panels, because this isn't one of those expansions where it's like, OK, we are getting on a ship and sailing off to this new continent that's part of Azeroth that map makers have mysteriously ignored for the last 10 years. <laughs> we are going to another plane of existence, effectively. We are going to the realm of death, to the afterlife. And so I need to also lay out some of the ground rules for how this whole, all, this whole place works. So bear with me, and then we'll put it all together at the end. There's a couple things where I'm going to gloss over some details, because we have a deep dive panel tomorrow where a few of my colleagues are going to go much more in depth on some of the features and systems. Anyway, let's get going. So for the lore nerds out in the crowd, you may recognize. You may recognize this, the Warcraft cosmology, which lays out the six primal forces that define the Warcraft universe. We have light and shadow, order and disorder, and yes, life and death. And so where and what is the Shadowlands? It's right there. It's been right there in front of us this whole time, just on the edge of reality, separated from us by this veil that has shattered. And that's where we're going. So to kick things off, let's talk about you know, some light topics, like what happens to us after we die in Azeroth or other worlds of Warcraft, anyway. So when death comes, a soul crosses between life and death. Spirit Healer makes that determination, and a winged bearer comes to bring the soul into the Shadowlands. And souls come before a mysterious entity, an ancient entity, known only as the Arbiter. The Arbiter, since time immemorial, has functioned in this capacity. And when that soul comes before her, in a fraction of a fraction of a second, every one of the contents of that soul is laid bare before her. All the deeds, the misdeeds, the thoughts, the aspirations, the triumphs, and the failures are felt, absorbed, and understood by the Arbiter. And the Arbiter sends that soul off to a destination realm, to one of the infinite realms of the Shadowlands, each one of which is ruled over by a powerful covenant, a ruling force within the Shadowlands. Also, and this will matter more in a second, but each soul brings with it a powerful source of energy known as anima. This is a vital force that is the product of all of that soul's experiences all that they have done in life. Great souls, whether for good or for evil, have a lot of anima, and ones who've lived smaller, more humble lives have less. But folks like Varian, Garrosh, certainly Arthas, the former Lich King, they had a ton. And anima is the mana. It is the, ironically, the lifeblood of the Shadowlands. In this land of death, it's the force that makes the trees here grow and rivers flow it's the source that's drawn upon to conduct the magic of death, and much more. And that's going to be essential to understanding this world. So as I mentioned, the Shadowlands has infinite realms, but our journey initially will focus on a few of them. We see Revendreth, Ardenweald, Bastion, and Maldraxxus as four major realms. Oribos, a city which stands in the center of it all, and this mysterious region known only as the Maw. Let's start talking about them. So first off, Bastion. 
Now, this, for each of these zones, I'm going to start by showing a piece of our internal concept art that helped define the look and the feel of the zone, and then we'll see how that turned into reality within the game. So this piece, which I'm sure you're all seeing for the very first time ever as an exclusive part of BlizzCon, re re reflects our artist's early take on the splendor of Bastion. Bastion is ruled over by the Kyrian Covenant. Now, the Kyrian are the forebears of the Valkyr and the spirit healers and more. The Kyrian are ordered and purposeful, and the souls that find their way here, that are sent here by the Arbiter, are ones that had some natural calling in life to service in one form or another. But they don't come here fully ready to assume their ascended role as a Kyrian. Souls come with burdens, and a lot of what goes on in Bastion is meditation, reflection, understanding self through combat and other means to shed those burdens and be ready to ascend to an eternity of service in the afterlife as a Valkyr or a spirit healer or one of a couple of other paths. An example of a soul that might be familiar to us who ended up in Bastion is Uther, the Lightbringer. And we will be encountering him, among others, in our journey through Bastion. And of course, if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, Bastion is the zone that's playable here on the show floor today. So here is a look at some of the environments of Bastion, glowing, resplendent, you know, very much distant from the dark and dreary images that might have been conjured up when you first heard the words Shadowlands. Because the land of death is not all darkness. There's a distinction there. Next. A bit of a darker place, the zone of Maldraxxus. So Maldraxxus, as initially defined in this concept, is ruled over by the Necrolord Covenant, and it reflects the heart of the Shadowlands' military might. The souls here defend the Shadowlands from external forces and wage war on the enemies of death. These are the forces that were called upon by the Lich King, by his servants Kel'Thuzad and others. And we've seen a piece of that. Now, while at a glance, OK, undead, rot, decay, this seems like, OK, these are all evil guys. That's not necessarily what Maldraxxus is about. While this power certainly can be used for evil, at its core really is more about just a relentless spirit, unyielding search and pursuit of power, strength, inward and outward. And an example of a soul that ended up in Maldraxxus is actually the warlord Draka, mother of Thrall, who, while certainly not an evil, wicked soul, was one who would never kneel, never bow before another. And she has actually ascended to, to a position of some prominence within Maldraxxus, as we will discover when we journey there. Let's take a couple of a look at how this is coming together. Now, if you think of Legion as the old Burning Crusade look and feel dialed up to 11. Maldraxxus is very much Eastern Plaguelands, the Scourge, and more taken to the nth degree. This is the source of that power and much more. Next, Ardenweald. Ardenweald is an enchanted fairy forest, and that was what we were setting out to create, and this concept by our environment team really helped define that look and the general vibe that we were going for. Now, Ardenweald is ruled over by the Night Fae. And we are familiar with the Emerald Dream, those of you who are Druids, maybe more so than most. And if we think of the Emerald Dream as a reflection of the spring and the summer, part of nature's cycle, Ardenweald reflects autumn and winter. It's a place of rest, yes, of death, but also a preparation for eventual rebirth. Because the journey into the Shadowlands isn't necessarily a one-way journey. And spirits of nature are the ones who are called powerfully to Ardenweald, and most of them come here to rest and to prepare to serve the wilds once more. An example of a powerful, well-known soul who ended up in Ardenweald is actually the demigod Cenarius. When he fell before the axes of Gromash Hellscream and his band of fell-infused orcs, his soul passed into Ardenweald, where he rested and recovered and returned to serve the wilds in a time of need during the events of the Cataclysm. 
So here's a look at how that general, you know, those concepts have been translated into in-world environments. As you look up in Ardenweald, you're looking at the underside of canopies of magical ancient trees that almost look like staring up at the night sky. But there are also some parts of Ardenweald that aren't faring quite as well, and that also reflect some sorts of powers that we may have seen recently, especially for those of you who are playing Alliance in Battle for Azeroth, because Ardenweald is also deeply connected to the Drust, who come from the land of death. Fourth up, Revendreth. Revendreth is awesome. It's basically just a creepy Gothic zone, miasma, soaring castles, villages in their shadow, and terrors and horrors lurking around every corner. Revendreth is ruled over by the Venthyr. This is our fourth major covenant. And Revendreth, unlike the other realms, maybe isn't the place that you would want to go or hope to go as a soul passing into the Shadowlands. The souls that the Arbiter has sent to Revendreth over the years tend to be the ones that have some flaw, whether it's pride or some other problem that's kind of blocking them, that, that's hindering their ability to serve the Shadowlands in one of the other known paths. And they come to Revendreth to atone, to do penance for their misdeeds, and potentially to be redeemed and to move on to one of the other realms, or perhaps not. Revendreth is not a particularly fun place to be, but it's an essential part of the engine of death that is the Shadowlands. An example of a soul that came here and whom we will encounter in our journeys is none other than Kael'tha Sunstrider. who, you know, after a setback or two, found his way <laughs> to this dark land. So here we see, you know, just sort of a look at the landscape, the silhouette of the spires that define the environment. This is one of my favorite zones. I can't wait to explore it. I can't wait for all of you to check it out. There are also parts of Revendreth where the light has actually broken through the clouds and seared the earth, and some are actually caged up here uh, because Exposure to the light does horrible, horrible things to many of the souls of this land. Okay, so I've used the word covenant a whole lot. What is a covenant? So a covenant is the ruling power of the Shadowlands. There are four major ones we're going to be encountering. The Kyrians and Bastion, the Necrolords and Maldraxxus, the Night Fae of Ardenweald, and the Venthyr of Revendreth, as described. Covenants are also really the number one major feature of Shadowlands. I think in Battle for Azeroth, we had a few different smaller features. We had islands, we had the heart of Azeroth, we had war fronts. Covenants are more like a garrison or an artifact in the sense of being what we call internally a build-around feature. They're integrated into every aspect of the game, and they're an essential part of your journey, your progression, your power, and more. Each of these covenants, as you encounter them in your journeys, will seek your aid, because you are a powerful, mighty hero who comes with some unique abilities, seeing as you actually are tethered to the land of the living, and you are coming alive from Azeroth, which we'll get to in a second. And of course, in exchange for this, each one of them offers access to their power and a variety of rewards. And so each of you will have to make a fateful choice. Which covenant will you join? Take a look at what that will mean for you. So a covenant entails multiple things. First off, each covenant has its own large narrative endgame arc. So in Battle for Azeroth, we had the Horde War campaign and the Alliance War campaign. In Shadowlands, we have four of those. Each one opens up at max level, depending on your choice, and will lead you through the world in different ways as you unravel the mysteries of the Shadowlands, but do so in pursuit of your covenant's goals and working to empower them, and thus yourself. Each covenant also brings with it two active abilities. One of these is class-specific. It's a combat ability that will change your moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. The other one is a universal ability that all members of that covenant will share. And if you check out the demo here today for Bastion, you can see the Kyrian abilities for any given class and mess around with them. Next, covenants bring with them an endgame progression system. There's a ritual known as soul binding, 
where as a member of a covenant, you can bond your soul to a powerful denizen of the Shadowlands, enhancing your abilities, unlocking new ones, and having a ton of customization there. At a glance, I know this sounds like, okay, this is the artifact system, this is the heart of Azeroth for this expansion. In some ways, it builds upon lessons learned from both of those. First and foremost, there is no artifact power to grind. This is not a... Yeah. Because, honestly, like, that was an essential starting point for us when, starting, when, when designing the system. I think one of the lessons we learned from Legion onwards is uh, there is something great about having endgame goals and customization and things to work towards and to not just have the things that modify your character come to a screeching halt when you hit max level. The flip side is, despite systems of diminishing returns and the other things we had in place in Legion and BFA, there's no question that there are social pressures. There are things that make it feel bad to play alts, where if you're not doing X amount of things every week, you feel like you're falling behind. You're letting your team down or you're letting your own characters down. We want to have a world where you can have goals to work towards, customization, differentiation, without the grind. More details on this to come. We're going to be talking more about Covenants in our Deep Dive panel tomorrow, but that's an essential piece of this. And of course, alongside the power, is also a wide array of cosmetic rewards that each Covenant has. You saw some of the armor sets in the expansion trailer, and there's a whole lot more beyond that. Each Covenant also has a home base, effectively, a sanctum. This is a cross in some ways between the Legion class hall, but also the, the general feeling that you might have had back in Legion playing through Suramar and restoring Shalaran and building it up from this dingy, dust, you know, dusty, dark hole in the, in the ground into a base with a teleportation network and allies that you'd recruited. And as you work to restore your Covenant's power, you will benefit from that, but you'll also be making choices along the way. Let's take a look at some of these rewards. So, if you join the Kyrian, let's say you're a warrior, this might be the plate set of armor that you can earn, a mount that you can earn, the active ability that all Kyrian warriors will have, Spear of Bastion. If you join the Venthyr or you joined the Night Fae, you would have a different ability there. And Unburden, a utility movement ability that all members of the Kyrian Covenant will have. With Covenant rewards, we're also looking at exploring some new cosmetic options. You know, recently we've seen a couple of fun cloak replacements in the form of a backpack or totems on the, on the Torrent Heritage armor. We want to do more with that to really change your silhouette. So, different covenants. So yeah, each covenant will offer a set of, cl of cloak replacements or back attachments. So whether you want you know, a halo or a pair of wings, or depending on the different covenants that you're joining, a different aesthetic entirely, you can pick the one that best suits you. Okay, so covenants. Taking a step back, let's get back to the world for a moment. So I mentioned the four zones, each of which has a covenant, and at the center of it all rests Oribos. Oribos is a city that, again, predates memory. It is of an unknown construction, and it is the home of the Arbiter, this powerful, mysterious being that really fuels the machine that is the Shadowlands. And that has drawn to it over the millennia all manner of beings across the Shadowlands and even some from other dimensions. Brokers and soul traders come here to wheel and deal. The politics of this entire dimension center on this bustling city at the heart of the Shadowlands. And this will also serve as our sanctuary city, our main player hub in our adventures through the Shadowlands. Cadgar wanted to bring Dalaran through, but we figured there was already a city there. <laughs> Not needed. Last zone, this mysterious place known as the Maw. So, to our knowledge anyway, there is no covenant. But our knowledge is very, very limited about this place. You see, the Maw is a swirling vortex of darkness, almost like a black hole. And precious few souls over the eons, the Arbiter would send directly into the Maw. Those were seen as the most tainted, the most irredeemable, the darkest, most dangerous souls that were consigned to the Maw as much for their own potential punishment as to protect the Shadowlands 
from what they could otherwise bring with them. Thus, the Maw is a mystery to even the natives of the Shadowlands, even the ancient ones. It's known to have, through whispers, a ruler known only as the Jailer. But the Jailer is almost like the boogeyman of the Shadowlands, right? It's the whispered figure of children's tales that, oh, you know, the big bad Jailer is going to get you locked away in the Maw. But basically, nothing is known because nothing has ever escaped the Maw. Journey into the Maw is one way. Of course, we're going to have to go there. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you this. But that's how it's going to work. OK, so what I just described is how the machinery of death has functioned throughout World of Warcraft's history, throughout the universe's history. But that's not how it's working right now. Death itself is broken. Instead of coming before the Arbiter and filtering out all the realms of the Shadowlands, all souls that have shuffled off this mortal coil in recent years have been pulled inexorably directly into the maw, strengthening it, causing it to grow, to swell like a tremendous maelstrom. That also means that the other realms of the Shadowlands are starved of this essential force, anima, that souls bring with them. There's a drought afflicting the entire Shadowlands. The Shadowlands are withering as the maw grows. Now, what is Sylvanas' role in all of this? you may wonder. Because she, after all, is the one who set these events in motion. And I know Sylvanas has been an enigma to many for a long time. She, at times, can be an inspiring figure. But then at other times, especially recently, it has seemed like her actions were calculated to cause the maximum. So yeah, slightly contentious issues here. Um, <laughs> at times recently, it seemed like her actions were calculated to cause the maximum amount of death possible. What if they were? And who is this mysterious figure that we saw briefly a glimpse of in the expansion trailer earlier today? <laughs> it's, it's not Arthas. Arthas is dead. I'm sorry. But, but this is the mysterious jailer inside the Maw. And this is not Sylvanas' master. She doesn't have a master. She is above that. She is beyond that. But this is a power with whom she is in league. They are partners with a common end that we will discover in time. And many have wondered, how has Sylvanas grown so powerful in recent years? How did she go from a mighty Dark Ranger, but one who had to flee the Lich King back in you know, Wrath of the Lich King when you confronted them in the dungeon, to one who could stand up, smite Sarfang, and face off against Bolvar? It's because through her allegiance to one of these Lords of Death, as the power of death has been growing, as the power of the Maw and the Jailer have been growing, so too have her own powers. And that is a taste of the power that she's drawn upon, and that's part of what awaits us. OK, now putting this all together. So expansion launches. Just before the expansion launches, we have you know, pre-patch events, as we enjoy having, to get people up to speed, get you caught up, maybe help leveling some alts here and there. This time around, as we've said, and as we've been told by Terranus, the Helm of Domination worn by the Lich King was essential to keep the undead of Azeroth in check to keep them under control. Well, without it, what are they doing? They're rampaging across the world. And so this sort of a Scourge Invasion 2.0 that we're cooking up that will set the stage for the journey that awaits us. So in the weeks leading up to Shadowlands, as the heroes of Azeroth fight to defend their homes and families and friends from the rampaging undead, they will also muster their forces to make for Ice Crown and try to attack the source of this evil where it began. A key leader in this is actually going to be Bolvar himself. He did not die. He was defeated. But he actually offers us some unique insight into this situation. Because he actually, more than any other being, 
has one foot in each realm and understands them both. When he was seared by the dragon fire of Alexstrasza, he was infused with the power and the energy of life. That's what was able to allow him to keep the powers of the undead at bay as he wore this helm. But having worn the helm, he has seen into the other world and understands what awaits us. And he and his death knights can also help us cross over into that world to understand what's going on there and to have a chance at saving our own. And so we will make for Ice Crown, we will cross over, and we will end up in the Maw, because that's where everything that goes into the Shadowlands is going. And our journey ends there. It's a really short expansion. <laughs> now, that, obviously not. So we, heroes of Azeroth, with a unique bond to the world soul of Azeroth herself, find ourselves uniquely able to escape the Maw. Not all who come with us will be able to escape. Some of our friends and great champions of Azeroth will be trapped behind, but we escape and we move on to Oribos, where we begin to learn about the nature of this new world and set out to level up through four zones in order, Bastion, Maldraxxus, Ardenweald, and Revendreth. So unlike the last couple of expansions, we want to get back to having a strong narrative arc that can span multiple zones. And so all people entering the Shadowlands will go on this journey. As you do this, you're going to work with each zone's powers, with each zone's covenant. As you earn their trust initially, they'll let you borrow their powers, so you can actually play with the active abilities that you'll have down the line. You get a sense of what your covenant's ethos is, their aesthetic. And all of this is as you're learning about the world, as you are trying to understand the foes that face you and defeat them, you're also getting prepared for a fateful choice. Which covenant do you want to join? Because that's the big choice that awaits you at max level. One of them. Exactly. You will choose one of them. And <laughs> after joining that covenant, you have its powers permanently, your covenant campaign begins, and you move into the end game. Now, that's how it's going to go your first time through. But what about alts, you may ask? So one of the big things that we got out of non-linear leveling in Legion and BFA was flexibility when you're leveling your alts. You can have a different journey on one character versus another. But what we lost was the ability to tell a single strong narrative story. We want to get the best of both worlds this time around. And so on your alts, once you have one character that's made it through this journey a single time, we want to say, well, we know, breaking the fourth wall for a second, that you as a player you understand how the world works. We don't need to teach you how covenants work. We don't need to teach you about the Shadowlands. So let's just let you pick a covenant right away, if that's what you want to do. And so you'll have access to their powers permanently. And on an alt, you can level up through any of the zones in any order that you want. You can do the narrative campaign, if that's what you want to do. Or you could go to Revendreth first or you could spam dungeons, or battlegrounds, or whatever. Endgame systems like world quests will also be available. Ultimately, it's about giving the maximum number of options. And finally, <laughs> you're welcome. And finally, I think one of the questions we ask ourselves is like, well, obviously, one of the things we see with people playing alts is there's a sense of wanting to rush through to get to the end game as quickly as possible. And why is that? And it's not just a WoW issue. It's something that happens in many other games, too. A lot of the time, once you've been to Endgame, you realize that a lot of things before then don't matter. And so why spend your time on things that don't matter when you should rush and get to the things that do? Well, why does it have to be that way? What if you could begin progressing on your various Endgame systems, unlocking powers with your soul binds and more as you're leveling up? So of course, you're still you know, getting your levels, progressing through that story, getting your character stronger, but the progression that you earn will matter at endgame, and you'll be meaningfully ahead of where you were when you first hit max level on your first character. OK, so back to our max level experience. So we've seen a glimpse of them all when we first arrived in the Shadowlands. And then we're going to have to, we'll probably visit it a couple more times over the course of level up, learning a little bit more about it, since we have this unique power to go in and out. But at max level, what is the Maw? So the Maw is terrible. It's a fearsome, terrifying place. 
But we've been to those before. We go to those all the time, right? Like we literally, not too long ago, we were fighting on the homeworld of the Burning Legion in the shadow of their great fortress. And coincidentally, we always manage to find a friendly innkeeper who will sell us water and let us bind our hearthstones. Doesn't matter how evil the place is, there's always that guy with the hearthstone. <laughs> not here. Um, we really set out in the Maw, in the outdoor space, to build an environment that matches the fantasy of the space. Where when you go in here, you will have to have your wits about you. Because it's a place that wants to kill you at every corner. There are definitely some lessons drawn from revisiting classic spawning and things along those lines. And it's a chance for us to explore some new types of outdoor world gameplay. Um, we're going to have a lot more to say about this at our deep dive panel tomorrow. But I just wanted to tee it up. This is a place that you'll be going to only at max level. And you'll be delving in here to uncover the mysteries of Sylvanas, the Jailer, and much more. At the center of the Maw is this mysterious place called Torghast Tower of the Damned. Yes, this is the tower that you saw sticking out of the sky above Ice Crown Citadel. Well, what does that mean in gameplay terms? I would call this our second major feature after Covenants. Because Torghast is a bit different from anything we've seen before. What Torghast is, is effectively an endless dungeon. It's ever-changing and defies the laws of reality in a lot of ways. Crafting Torghast, we looked to, for inspiration to a lot of our favorite roguelike games. And well, what does that mean? It means an environment that changes each time you come there. When we create this experience, we want it to be one that you can enter solo, or with friends. If you want a sense of end game progression that is meaningful and challenging, that doesn't re require bringing a group with you, Torghast is there for you. Of course, if you want to bring your friends with you, don't say no, you can do that too. As you ascend the tower on visits that will change from run to run, from visit to visit, you can earn permanent upgrades that you can take out with you, but also, on the course of your visit, you'll be able to absorb powerful concentrations of anima that massively change and enhance your powers. Because this is one of the other really fun parts of roguelike gameplay. It allows us to offer huge upgrades, transformative things that make each visit different from the next. You can play to your strength, shore up your weaknesses, and much more. This is the thing we're going to talk a lot more about tomorrow, just so just teeing it up here. Um, but just a random example of a choice that you may be faced with early on in your journey into Torghast. Let's say you're playing a Shaman. You get a source of upgrades. Do you want some you know, passive damage and healing, which of course everyone wants, or a permanent transformative upgrade to one of your abilities that will last throughout the rest of your journey? A different journey might offer different options and different upgrades. None is going to be quite like the others. The interior of Torghast definitely calls upon the architecture that we saw in Ice Crown Citadel and elsewhere. Though as you ascend to the higher reaches of the tower, who knows what you're going to find. In addition to Torghast, we have eight dungeons on offer. Four for level up, one in each zone. Um, each of these dungeons, of course, comes with you know, the normal modes, Heroic, Mythic, Mythic Plus, with all new affixes coming for each season in Shadowlands and four max level dungeons. Now, one of my favorites I want to call out here uh, is this dungeon called The Other Side, or The Other Side in Ardenweald, uh, which is a pocket dimension home to none other than everyone's favorite Loa, Wansambi. So he, he's been quite the trickster, and we've never really known exactly whose side he's on or what he's up to and who he serves. And this is going to give us a chance to explore that. It's, it's a great opportunity to revisit one of our favorite characters coming out of Battle for Azeroth. And of course, he is rooted in the Shadowlands. We also have a 10-boss raid at launch called Castle Nathria. Uh, this was a super fun project for our dungeon team and our encounter designers. Like, the, the ask was literally just build Dracula's castle, make it a raid. <laughs> it kind of writes itself. It's going to be pretty awesome. Um, here's an early layout as we're starting to figure out how it's going to flow. Uh, you'll come in the main front door of the castle for once you're not coming in through the sewer. And it's a winged raid, so you'll have a choice of descending into the catacombs or exploring the royal quarters, each of which have three more bosses. Once you've cleared both of those wings, the upper reaches of the castle will become available as you ascend 
to the upper spire to face the lord of the castle himself. Okay, so talked a lot about content. Let's talk a little bit about systems. Again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on some things briefly here that we're gonna get into greater detail about tomorrow with the deep dive. But first off, as we've thought about all of these things, our core philosophy, a central pillar, has been we want to increase player agency. We want to give all of you a feeling of more control over your destiny, whether that's in how you play your class, whether that's in how you chase the rewards that you want. We've heard a lot of your feedback. We've been hearing this for a while, and it hasn't fallen on deaf ears, I promise. I want to give a few examples of how this philosophy is influencing some of our decisions, and we'll have many more to follow. You know, big expansion systems and the nuances of how loot works, these are things we're going to keep iterating on over the course of development. So I don't have a fully fleshed out answer to provide right now, but I want to give you a direction of how we're thinking. So one simple example first, professions. So right now, if you are a leather worker or a blacksmith or a tailor and you want to make a pair of legs for yourself to wear using raid materials, you probably have a couple of stats in mind. Let's say you want crit haste pants. And so you're crafting, and whoops, you got mastery versatility pants. And you craft and craft and salvage and craft until you get the ones you want. Why does it have to be that way? What if you could take a crit gem and a haste gem and add them as optional materials to your craft and be guaranteed to get a crafted item with the secondary stats you want? It's a small example. I realize that's not you know, fixing professions, but we also do very much want to make the armor crafting professions relevant in a deeper way at endgame. The weekly loot chest. Okay, is there any more hated example of RNG in World of Warcraft today? Right? You, you, you've done your mythic keystone, you filled your conquest bar, you go to open this chest, and you're pulling from a loot table that has like 100 plus items and hoping that you get the item that you want in the slot that you want with the stats that you want and hopefully it's sockets and war forges or even titan forges and then maybe you can wear it. And most of the time, after the first few weeks of a season, you're probably walking away disappointed. And that sucks. Because the point of that is to be a major reward moment. It's a payoff for something that you did in the past week and because of randomness, that's falling short. And it's an example of randomness gone too far. Randomness can be healthy, but there are places where it really is excessive. We're looking at pulling that back where possible. So what if instead of the loot chest, there was some other device, some contraption that measured the things that you'd done, that had some sense of how many dungeons you'd done, of what difficulty or what your PvP rating was, or what bosses you'd bonus rolled, and it could instead materialize or create one of a list of items. And instead of clicking the chest and it spitting out a random item, you saw five or six options to choose among, and you could pick the one that you wanted most. And so that's the kind of thing we're aiming for, um, with also some universally relevant fallback option if you don't like any of those items, so that you always at least feel like you made some progress towards some goal, instead of walking away disappointed. Legendaries. So. Okay, here's the thing. Legion legendaries were super fun. They were exciting items that transformed your gameplay. 99% of the complaints that we heard about Legion legendaries were in how they were obtained. Having the Power Blast Bracers was awesome. It made you play differently as a Fire Mage, and it was strong. Having Pride as, when the other Fire Mage in your raid group had the Power Blast Bracers, and having nothing you could do to change that did not feel awesome. So, we want to bring legendaries back in Shadowlands, but rather than have them be randomly obtained, we want them to be something that you can work towards actually crafting through your work in Torghast. <laughs> you are earning access to legendary powers and then building the legendary that suits your gameplay style, working towards that goal, then once you accomplish it, picking the next goal you want to work towards and doing so. Last. Classes. So this is, a, this is a little bit different from you know, agency in other ways, but we've moved in the, last, in the last few years pretty heavily away from broad class identity to a point where an arcane mage and a fire mage may have more that sets them apart than they have in common. 
And when you all picked the character you wanted to make, whether it was a week ago or 15 years ago, you, didn't, you chose to be a hunter or a rogue or a priest for some specific reason, not a Marx hunter or a subtlety rogue or a disciplined priest. And increasingly, that's been overly compartmentalized in ways that have restricted your ability to play the class in the way you might want to play the class. So we're going to talk about this a lot tomorrow at our deep dive panel. And this means, in some cases, taking abilities that have become spec specific and bringing them back to being class wide. In other cases, it means returning abilities that were taken away altogether. And so t talking about this, so sharing this at length tomorrow at our deep dive panel will be my colleague, Brian Halinka, or as I like to call him, Halinka the Unpruner. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm going to go kind of quickly since you know too much time left, but leveling. So you may notice that I've said max level a whole bunch of times in this presentation. I haven't said a number. And some of you who've made it to our demo may have noticed, what the heck? I'm level 50. You're level 50. So, so existing 120 characters are 50. Everything scaled smoothly in between. And you will level from 50 to 60 in the Shadowlands. Why are we doing this? Why these numbers? Ultimately. It's about making the experience better paced. We have hundreds of hours of content that we've built in the game over the last 15 years. We don't want it to take hundreds of hours to get to max level. We want to speed up the rate at which you level to get into endgame and give you more freedom and options in how you do that. But if you're getting a level literally every 10 minutes along the way, that starts to feel a bit silly. So this number allows us to better match the content that we have that should be experienced on the way to max level and also get back to a place where every level, every time you fill that bar, gives you something, because this is an RPG, and that's what levels should do. So we also have a brand new new player zone to show off some of the best of modern World of Warcraft to new players. And on your alts, we want to give you the option to play through the storyline of any single expansion in its entirety to get you from 1 to 50. If you want to play through Pandaria, play through the whole thing, and then go to Shadowlands. OK. Um, a different type of agency, agency of self-expression. Want to talk a little bit about visual character customization, character appearances. Right? Like, everyone here, you have this powerful connection to your WoW character. I've seen people spend way too long messing with hairstyles, picking the exact look, the exact facial expression, because that's your avatar in the game. That's your connection to the world. We always want to do better there. We always want to increase the fidelity. We want to give more options. And so in recent expansions, we've done things like add allied races or improve the combat animations. This time around, our focus is on improving the customization that's available to the original World of Warcraft races. Now, what I want to share with you, I'm going to share with you a few examples of our work in progress from a few WoW races. But the idea here is just to give more options than ever before so that you can actually look and feel like you want to feel and different from the others around you who play the exact same race. So let's take a look at some of what's in store. Trolls. So, so for trolls, we want to give you options for different skin colors, hair colors, hairstyles, tusk shapes, piercings, body paints, tattoos, and also amazing things like the ability to set your eye color different from the look of your face. Because, I, I don't know, it's 2020. The technology is finally there. What can I say? Uh, dwarves. So. Similarly, if you want some, you know, you want that wild hammer look, go for it. Different skin colors, hair colors, and more. Uh, maybe you play an undead, a forsaken. And you don't want all of your bony parts sticking out of your flesh. Or maybe you do. Up to you. And last but certainly not least in my examples, humans. Perhaps. Perhaps you play a human in World of Warcraft and wish that you could play a character that looks and feels a little bit more like you. We agree. So. 
And so this is the tip of the iceberg. We have many more examples to come. And this is something really that's an endless process of improvement for us, but this is a first step. Finally, one more small thing. I mentioned earlier that you know, Bolvar and his Death Knights are very important to this battle that awaits us. And so what better time to bolster the ranks of Death Knights than now? So in Shadowlands, everyone can be a Death Knight. Pandaren, Kul'Tiran, Zandalari, Mechanome, Volpera, go nuts. All right, that's all I got for now. Thank you so much for joining me on this whirlwind tour of Shadowlands. Lots more information tomorrow. So right here tomorrow, we'll have our deep dive panel at 11, uh, just before noon, and then Q&A and developers' tales later in the day. Enjoy BlizzCon. Have a wonderful weekend. I love you all. Thank you for attending World of Warcraft, What's Next? Coming up, Hearthstone, What's Next?